from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Eleanor Oldroyd, stepping in for Alison Mitchell. I'm here in London where it is cold, it is frosty across the country, record low temperatures, snow and ice in the highlands. Uh, Jim Maxwell, it's a place you know well and I would love to be sitting next to you in my possibly favourite cricket ground in the world. It's a beautiful place. It's looking lovely at the moment. We're in twilight time after the second day's play, and uh, it just looks superb. You could do an OB out there on the ground in mm. lovely temperatures of 25 degrees. So, hmm, fantasize. Absolutely. I'd love to be in Adelaide. Well, I'm at a cricket ground as well, which is made by my friend Sanjay Joshi in the middle of nowhere between Mumbai and Pune. Hello, this is Charu Sharma. I'm, uh, here for Akashwani, happy to be on Stumped and looking forward to a game against the visiting Aussies from Wesley College in Melbourne in just a short while. So Charu is going to be in action later on. Jim is coming to the end of his day. I'm starting my day and later on in the programme, <laughs> we'll be looking back at India's T20 series against Afghanistan. We will ask if India have found a new gem with the T20 World Cup looming. But first, Jim, we'll start at Adelaide Oval, where you are for the first test between Australia and West Indies. A lot of focus on Steve Smith making his first appearance as a test opener, replacing the prolific David Warner. But it wasn't the start that Smith was hoping for. Wow, it was an incredible catch as well. And what a debut for Shamar Joseph. But first of all, Steve Smith, Jim, I mean, what was the reaction in Australia to him being announced as an opener? Bearing in mind he's not played in that position before and the start that he made. A few question marks, but I, I think the fact uh, that he became uh, only the 23rd player to be dismissed by debutants first ball in Test cricket kind of overshadowed uh, his paltry score uh, because this chap has come from the back blocks of Guyana after five first-class matches, uh, ended up taking five wickets in the innings. So uh, perhaps luckily for Smith, um, he, he wasn't the, the main focus of what turned out to be a, a pretty exciting day or two here in Adelaide. Um, and Sharma certainly was, having top scored uh, for a number 11 at 36 and then taken all those wickets. So good on him for doing that. The West Indies need a little bit of boosting here. Uh, the the Minnows really playing against the big boys and that's the way it's looking on the scoreboard. Mm, yeah, it came close to being a two-day test match, but they will go into a third day. And, and Charu, what did you make of Shamar Joseph? I mean, he, he as, as Jim says, spared Steve Smith's blushes. Well, it's always nice to see the birth of a new star, and especially from the West Indies, where new stars have been a little short in the past, uh, or even a decade or two. Uh, but typically, the team is so mercurial that, uh, you know, well, almost always... Uh, I mean, they give you a, a, a glimmer of hope and then, of course, they tank completely. So I'm very disappointed at how uh, the test match is currently poised. But just back to Shamar, yeah, you know, wonderful debut always makes you believe in a cricketing nation that if that kind of talent is available, one, where was it? Why was it not blood earlier? And as we know, they haven't quite sent their so-called number one team to Australia, which is strange enough anyway. But all these... Uh, situations give, give rise to possibilities where new, young, hungry stars are allowed uh, their space under the sun. And what better to start the way Shamar did in Australia, which is one of the toughest places to do very well in. And that, mm. to me, just signals that the West Indies are not through yet. I mean, they haven't done very well in international cricket for a variety of reasons. But if they have somebody like Shamar Brooks, who can come in and do what he did in Australia, first match, then surely we can all still hope that the West Indies have a lot of talent. It just needs to somehow be given more air. And uh, I don't know what the commercial situation in, in the West Indies is, because will they continue, even Shamar, soon, will he continue to go the franchise route and try and make a quick livelihood out of his talent? Or will he stay with the mainline West Indies red ball team? So all of a sudden, those questions are going to be asked within a couple of matches. And this is the problem, Jim, isn't it, really? When you, you look at, I mean, Jason Holder, who was, was their test captain a few years ago, Nicholas Puran, uh, Carl Mayers, all opting out of, of the tour to, to play in franchise cricket. You're always going to make more money playing franchise cricket unless you've got support from the board. And, and the West Indies board just don't have 
the money that, you know, that other boards have, you know, for example, the English, Australian and Indian boards. It needs the altruism of India, Australia and England to give the West Indies some sustenance. If you think about it, the top players here, Kamar Roach and Craig Brathwaite, probably get 250000 US on their central contract. Compare that to the Australians. It'd be well over a million for the top players. So, you know, it's understandable that those Australian players, for the most part, will be part of the fold, even though the IPL auction is uh, helping a few of them along in the next couple of months. But um, it's much easier to be in Australia's position as a test nation than the West Indies. I mean, there have been 10 players turned over from... 12 months ago to this tour by the West Indies and uh, most of those players are playing in some T20 thing in Dubai. So fair enough, uh, they're going to make money out of that and um, I really think it's not just the ICC, it's the major nations, India, England and Australia, that have to start saying, right, if Test Cricket's going to survive, we need to support it by giving them some of the cake that we're eating. What do you think about that, Charu? I mean, Johnny Grave, who is who runs West Indies cricket, has made this point in the last twenty four hours or so. That, it, but it, is it not just West Indies that need supporting? But I mean, South Africa are not well off at the moment, are they? Are they? Is it is it down to the ECB, Cricket Australia, and the BCCI to do more just for the sake of Test cricket? Well, it's a good thought, but I don't really see it happening because uh, <laughs> because these three boards you mentioned are, I, I think accepting what they're given almost by a sense of right because they are the big three and why should we share if we're given this money we will keep it so i'm afraid i'm going to put the owners back on the people who are dispersing the cash or dispersing the amount i think the icc needs to perhaps relook at what do they really want from the game or where do they want the game to go if the top three nations are just going to become stronger and stronger the rich becoming richer then I really don't think cricket will be as diverse a game as most of us wish it would be because there are so many new nations as well. I'm not suggesting that the problem is easy to solve uh, because, as you said, you've got to look after the test-playing nations first. And if there's some parity there in terms of disbursement, then, of course, we can start looking at all the rest of the associate nations and then, of course, third tier and, and the newer nations as well if the game is to develop because, uh, sadly, it does require a fair amount of infrastructure. It's not a cheap game to, to develop. And unless the Apex organization wishes for the game to become more global, it's going to remain in this very restricted uh, rich nations becoming richer format, which it may not be the best way to go in terms of widening the game and, and, and making it a truly Olympic game where many other nations are also perhaps hopeful of doing well. Well, so that test match at Adelaide Oval looking set for an early finish and people who've got tickets there who are not going to be watching any action might want to do a tour of the ground because it is, as I said, one of my absolute favourite cricket grounds in the world and I was so privileged to go there and have a look at the iconic Adelaide Oval scoreboard back in 2017. It's one of the great landmarks in world cricket. It's large wooden letter tiles, uh, but it's made significant changes over the past few months, most notably in the Women's Big Bash League. Now, the scoreboard has been in use since 1911 and is the only manual scoreboard still operating in major Australian venues to this day. So one of the changes that fans witnessed was that the word batsman was replaced with batting to be gender neutral. Um, it was such fun to go behind the scenes. Jim, I don't know if you remember that. You'd have been working on that test match as well, uh, out there for, for test match special, all of us working together and, and getting to go inside the score box. I mean, when you when you are looking from where you sit at the ground in, in the commentary box for the ABC, Jim, just describe the view that you have of that end of the ground with, with the cathedral, which you can still just about see behind. Can you see it over there if I turn the screen around? Beautiful. The a, Morton Bay figs as well. Yeah. I mean, it is an uh, iconic uh, scoreboard, and, and it's one of the reasons why this is still a cricket ground and not a damn stadium like so many other places have become with their electronic scoreboards, which uh, drive commentators mad because they'll cut to something just when you want to. And, oh, what was the score? So <laughs> that, that's why that scoreboard is 
so useful. And um, it, it's one of the, the treasures of this ground, it, which is a lovely combination of the old and the new. And that's why it's still a ground and not a stadium. You can actually see grass, trees. You can feel the breeze blowing through the place. And you can see that wonderful scoreboard with all the information that it provides. So this is still, to a large extent, what I'd call a proper cricket ground. And I can't say that about some of the other places, which are ugly, uh, unimpressive stadiums. Very good for football or concerts, but no good for cricket, no. As I said, I, it was an ambition fulfilled when I finally got to go there for the first time. I'm delighted to say that we can speak to Trevor Manuel, who is a volunteer tour ambassador at Adelaide Oval. Um, Trevor, good day. Lovely to talk to you. Hi. How are you? Um, we, sh we should say first and foremost that it is always Adelaide Oval and not the Adelaide Oval, shouldn't we? Well, it depends when you're talking about because back in 1871 when uh, the South Australian Cricketers Association was formed and uh, they started to develop the Oval, it was actually called the Oval. The committee named it after um, Kennington Oval, which back in the 1870s they decided was the premier cricket ground anywhere in the world and so our Oval should bear that same name. It became Adelaide Oval about 10 years later. Adelaide got into general use in the name of the Oval um, and we have been Adelaide Oval ever since. The school board, just, just tell us a little bit about the history of the school board. As I said, it's been there since 1911. I mean, what does it mean to you and to, to South Australians? Well, I'm, I'm glad Jim could show you the school board because um, if some of the committee had had their way back in 1911, it wouldn't have been where it is now. Uh, they wanted it built on the uh, south uh, eastern corner rather than the northeastern corner. And uh, the architect who designed it, Kenneth Milne, um, he was vehemently opposed to building it where they wanted it. And so he had to convince them to build it on the, the mound next to the Morton Bay fig trees. And he told them that if they built it on the southeastern mound, uh, there'd be extensive works in reinforcing the, uh, the mound that was there um, all sorts of excavations that would cost them a whole lot more. And, of course, they went for the cheaper quote, built it on the, the northeastern mound, and we think we know who got it right 112 years later. Mm. I mean, this is a world, as Jim has said, where, where technology, um, AI is becoming the norm. I mean, it's an anomaly, really, isn't it, to have something which is operated with levers and pulleys and hand-painted signs? Yes. Um, and, I mean, that's the... The glamour of it really is is the fact that it's a manually operated scoreboard and that it, it shows so much information. If you could just take us right now, Trevor, inside the scoreboard, mm. the scoreboard itself and inside the box, just describe what people see when they go on a tour of the ground. The bottom level of the scoreboard in, in true Australian fashion is a bar to service all the people on the mound. And then above the bar, there are four levels of the scoreboard. And uh, during a, a test match, like the current one, there's about five operators working inside the scoreboard across the four levels. Um, there's one who operates the lights to show who fields the ball and which batter's facing up. Uh, another one does the, the totals and the sundries. And then the two batters who are out in the middle, their names are actually up on level two. So there's someone else up there changing the runs that they're scoring. And then there's also the the need to change the bowlers' um, figures and the, uh, move the nameplates when someone gets out and all of that. And how hot does it get in there on a match day? <laughs> it gets very hot. Um, we usually tell our, our tour guests that, uh, you know, sometimes in Adelaide you'll see the shutters open for no apparent reason on a hot day. The no apparent reason is the poor guys working in there are trying to get a bit of air in there because there's a, the back wall is actually corrugated iron and the front wall's painted black, and that faces the afternoon sun. So it, it does get very, very hot inside the scoreboard. Well, it's been great to talk to you, Trevor. Um, hopefully I'll get you to give me a tour next time I manage to get to Adelaide. I certainly will. No problems. Brilliant. Trevor Manuel, who is one of the volunteer tour ambassadors at Adelaide Oval.
Finally on Stumped, it's going to be a huge year for T20 cricket with the marquee World Cup event taking place in June, co-hosted by USA and West Indies. The question on many Indian fans' minds is whether all-rounder Shivam Dubé could be the answer. He's been making headlines this week after, be making, after making back-to-back half-centuries as India sealed the T20 series against Afghanistan. Uh, Charu, he made 60 in the first T20 and then 63 off 32 balls in the second encounter and a lot of people are saying Shivam Dube why have we not heard of him before what what how impressed have you been with him well we have heard of him before because uh, he uh, in fact there's a bit of a story here where his father who was a wrestler uh, didn't quite want his son to go into wrestling but rather into cricket where as you know it's uh, you know the big thing in India now so Shivam started out early but he was always a little should we say, uh, uh, he wasn't the slimmest young man. And there was a long period in his life between the ages of, what, 13 to 16, 17, where he actually gave up the game, thinking, well, I'm, I'm just not ever going to be fit enough for what the requirements of international cricket. So in a sense, there were, he was a late bloomer and came onto the stage back when he was 18 or 19 or so. Now, he obviously wants to be the all-rounder that India or most teams are happy to have in, say, the absence of a Hardik Pandya, who will perhaps be the first choice of uh, a fast-bowling all-rounder. But although he can hit the ball a very long way, and he does because of those long levers, he's about six foot four and, and, and very well muscled, it's in the bowling department that he hasn't really starred. In fact, there's a, the dubious distinction of giving 34 away to New Zealand, I think Ross Taylor and whoever else Seifert was involved there. So his bowling hasn't quite hit the highs, although he took a wicket in the series uh, against Afghanistan. But for batsmen to be given opportunities in India against Afghanistan, you've got to say that if they don't capitalize then, they never will. Uh, he has, because of these two innings, come back into national reckoning. But I'm afraid I, I, I think there's a lot of competition. And of course, if Hardik Pandya is fit, then I think Shubham will have to sit out. Uh, but it's just great for the young man that he's, I say young, although he's 30, uh, that he's back in national reckoning. He's had a little on-again, off-again kind of uh, love affair with the Indian team back from 2018-19. That was reasonably well for uh, uh, the Chennai Super Kings, and therefore Dhoni is one of his uh, big mentors. But yes, it's, it's a name, uh, I think, largely for his batting. I'm not so sure he is the all-rounder that India is looking for to uh, replace Hardik Pandya in case, God forbid, he's injured. It's never too late to learn, though, is it, Jim? And and he's talked about the fact that Stephen Fleming, um, Mike Hussey, Australian legend, of course, um, and and say saying that they have always shown faith in him, and that has been powerful for his game. So he is still learning, by the sound of it. By the sound of it, yes. I'm, I have to confess, I haven't seen him play in this particular series that's just gone by. So. Uh, the thing that is obvious with Indian cricket is that there's quite a lot of depth, quite a few choices. But, you know, they want their best team on the park playing their best cricket and not being a, a bit gun shy or overtaken by what occurs during big matches, as was obviously the case in the World Cup finals some months ago against Australia. So they've, they've got the personnel, whether this chap you're talking about has has got the ability to match it and move on past a few of the contemporaries is is another matter but there's certainly some strength around the Indian side but um, you wonder how much of a hangover they're still going to have in the next month or two as we head towards that that T20 about what they failed to do when everyone in India expected them to romp in uh, to win that 50 over competition. (laughs) I was going to ask you that very question, Charu, actually, because that wait for for an ICC trophy goes on, doesn't it, for India? Um, how much pressure, how much conversation is there in India about what this T20 team can do? Well, it's going to ramp up the conversation, but the expectations will always be at a high. You can bank on that. You know, every time the Indian team goes to play any match anywhere in the world, the Indian fans think, well, why aren't we winning? Because you can't win every match, but who's to tell them that? There's certainly some very fine T20 players. And of course, that has been assisted by the fact that India do run the IPL, which is the mecca of T20 cricket. And there's so many hungry young cricketers. It's just that tournaments tend to be a marathon and you've got to win everything. You've got to win everything at, at the right time. And you miss one match somewhere in a knockout stage and all the good work is undone. 
If they don't win, I, the, the Indian public will be very disappointed, but they will, uh, I repeat myself, be leading contenders again. Thank you very much indeed to Charu. Thank you so much to Jim as well. Um, and before we go, just a reminder that Stumped has been nominated for Best Cricket Podcast in the Sports Podcast Awards. There are two weeks left to vote. Go to sportspodcastgroup.com to vote. Uh, Jim Maxwell, Charu Sharma, brilliant to see you and we will see you again next week on Stumped. <laughs> 